Live from Palo Alto, in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE, covering I.O. Brought to you by I.O. Now, here's your host, John Furrier. Hello everyone, we are here at the Rosewood for a special CUBE presentation. Uh, it's about data centers, it's about the cloud. I'm John Furrier, we're here broadcasting live all day as part of IO Conversations, and we're going to hear with special guest Steve Powell, who's the CMO of Igneous Systems. Uh, welcome to the CUBE, good to see you again. Yes, thanks John. Great so you guys are in stealth, so you can't really talk about what you're, what you're covering, so we're going to try to get the data out of you. So what do you guys, uh, you guys been in stealth for a while, talk a little bit about the company, uh, obviously in stealth, so you guys are going to come out of stealth pretty shortly, but you guys have been in stealth for a while. Give us some history on uh, the company. Sure, so uh, at Igneous, we're a Seattle-based uh, venture capital uh, funded company. We, uh, uh, as you mentioned, we've been operating in stealth. We have actually uh, been been selling to customers, but we've been really working with you know the kinds of early adopter you know customers that wanted to go ahead and take the journey with us. Uh, the company was actually founded uh, by uh, a couple of former uh, Isilon guys. So our our founding CEO is a guy by the name of Kiran Bagheshpur. I worked with Kiran uh, you know 20 years ago when we were back here in Silicon Valley, and uh, Kiran was. Uh, 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 last, the, uh, the the VP of engineering for the Isilon storage division of EMC. He, uh, Jeff Hughes, and a guy who named uh, Byron Rikitsis, who was the actually first non-founding employee of NetApp, actually all uh, started a company. And uh, what we did, we're in Seattle, we're uh, in Cloud City, we've brought in some DNA from uh, the likes of Amazon and Microsoft. And yeah. basically, you know, what we're yeah. doing is looking to uh, uh, you know, really build uh, a hybrid of systems expertise and cloud native expertise and, uh, and form a new company. So what year was that? And so just want to get specific on stealth time frame. Sure. One, two years, how many years have you been in stealth? Sure, so uh, the company was actually founded uh, in late 2013. Uh, we announced our uh, Series A funding in early 2014. And uh, we have actually been, you know, pretty heads down in, in R&D and working yeah. with early adopter customers since then. You know, it's really impressive is the founding team is, is a rock stars in storage. You mentioned this now, we're in a new world of you know, cloud meets systems meets software. Uh, obviously NetApp was really, up until I say pure storage, has been really one of those storage companies that uh, like Isilon have made it, okay, from startup. And Isilon was huge, impressive success story, obviously then became part of EMC. But they were doing big data before it was called big data. So you have the chops in storage, you have the expertise on the engineering side, especially with the Isilon, large scale data. Is that kind of the same itch that he's been scratching, the founding team's been scratching that same itch, and, and how does that relate to today? Because we all see Facebook, we all see the big names, the web scalers they've been called, but now the enterprises are now trying to be like that. That's, so so yes. tell, tell me, does that fit into the into this mission that you guys are, are uh, going after? Yeah, we, I think you're figuring it out. So I think that one of the things that's really happened is, is that, uh, that there's been this tremendous data growth, and uh, you know what's really been happening is, is this data growth has largely been around uh, machine generated data where uh, a lot of the analysis is actually done by machines. I mean, humans are basically only involved to actually train machine learning algorithms. And so what we're seeing now is that, you know, even uh, everyday enterprises are, you know, finding a lot of pressures in yeah. dealing with this big data, this big complexity in managing uh, uh, large data volumes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the hyperscale guys had figured out a way to go do it. And uh, whether it's the likes of you know, certainly the real hyperscale providers like uh, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft Azure, um, but even you know enterprises that are operating at scale, the the, the Apples and the Facebooks. And what we realized is that the average uh, enterprise can't actually home grow uh, an infrastructure the way that they've done it. You know, Facebook and Apple and Google and Microsoft. And so, how do you go provide you know that kind of hyperscale leverage to the the everyday enterprise? So I got to ask. I mean, this is the question that, that comes up and pops in my head when I think about. Isilon, at the, in, in its day, it was cutting edge, but some say it's kind of gotten old and the market has shifted, obviously with the cloud, with Amazon Web Services, you're seeing massive growth. I think their storage businesses are in the two plus billion dollars that you kind of look at and squint through some of the numbers, and, that's a ma and it's continuing to grow, where it will be at reInvent kind of unpacking that. But what's different, I mean, let's take Isilon, let's take NetApp, obviously NetApp bought SolidFire, so they're trying to modernize. 
some would say, hey, Isilon, that's old technology. What, are they bring in the same old Isilon playbook here? No. <laughs> um, so, I mean, explain, what is the newness of what you guys are doing? You know, I know you can try to get the, the yeah, data yeah. out of you from the launch and you would try to hold it back in because you got the big launch coming up, but I mean, you're a briefing analyst, so what's the new, what's the new thing? Yeah, so, you know, I think that really the, the, the play here, and this is, you know, all uh, architectures right now are really about uh, how you do uh, distributed systems. And mm -hmm. so when it comes down to it, the way that folks like Google or Amazon have built their infrastructure is by uh, uh, by loosely coupling distributed systems. And what they do is they build up clouds of lots of identical components. And what that does is that gives you scalability uh, mm -hmm. because you've got lots of identical components. But but moreover, what it gives you is resiliency. So, uh, you know, there's a term, you know, uh, 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 raise cattle, not pets. Uh, have you heard that before? Yeah, I have, yeah. yeah absolutely. And yeah. so the whole concept is is that, you know, a pet, uh, you have to do a lot of care and feeding of, but, you know, cattle, uh, you can just continue to scale, and if, if something goes wrong, you know, you can, you can let that, you know, cattle uh, go to pass. And that's, you know, really the, uh, the concept that's actually been built in these hyperscale cloud providers with loosely coupled distributed systems. And I think that really the, the play here with, uh, with Igneous is to take advantage of that kind of technology. In fact, uh, uh, today we've already gotten 11 patents in, by the, issued by the U.S. Patent Office you know, around uh, how we're actually yeah. scaling down uh, those loosely coupled distributed systems really for enterprise scale. I'm looking forward to the, the launch and I can't wait to, to see what the specifics are and can dig into that. But, uh, but you know, you mentioned the cattle versus the pets analogy. I love that metaphor. I think there was one more. I had someone cube guess say he brought it to a whole other level which went more serverless, I think it was. Absolutely. Uh, there's a whole nother, another set with you don't like cattle, you can go serverless. But that, what that points to is the pet uh, vendors who are out there, like, oh, I have a server, I'm going to rack and stack, top of rack, all this data center enterprise terminology, we're really pets. And yeah, I think absolutely. that's the real thing, like, you know, you got to, I love my box, I love the speeds and feeds, and you're saying, no, cattle's much more of an aggregate. Yeah, Build that's out. right. So that and that's the that's the real key. That most of these enter, enterprise, uh, you know, traditional enterprise equipment, you know, vendors really design their architectures around uh, highly transactional models. I mean, even an Isilon is based on a highly uh, transactional model. And what, what we've done is is made things a lot more cloud-like. So you know, the core of our technology is basically about how you take distributed systems and bring that down to an enterprise level. Well, Peter Burris um, and I had a, have uh, a new. Um, Podcast called Cube Fridays. Every Friday we go to we talk about the trends and uh, folks watching go to soundcloud.com slash cubecasts or go to iTunes and search for uh, Cube Fridays. But one of the things, and we do that every Friday so you can hear our opinions and it certainly it's very opinionated and very colorful. But one of the things we were talking this past Friday on our Cube Friday uh, podcast show was that the, the data center business is shifting obviously to the cloud. And I think all net new applications, whether it's enterprise or cloud native, will be in the cloud in some instance. But the cloud isn't necessarily Amazon Web Services. Yeah. It's the enterprises kind of wanting getting out of the data center business. So is that kind of what you're seeing with the data? Is that, you know, there's obviously some data you can't put in the cloud. Is that what you guys are targeting? And talk about that dynamic of net new applications and data moving to the cloud. You know, absolutely. And you know, the cloud has you know so many uh, uh, great attributes. I mean, if you're an application developer, uh, you know, the whole thing that's that's cool about the cloud is that you don't actually worry about the details of how to scale the infrastructure. You don't worry about maintenance. You don't worry about software updates. You don't worry uh, about failure management or troubleshooting. Um, really, what you do is you interact uh, with the cloud via APIs. And so, uh, so the cloud is API driven and automated. And what that's done is, is that's turned IT guys from the buyers and maintainers of stuff, you know, into uh, business partners with their end user groups uh, that really identify requirements and to really ensure architectural that, kind of conversations. That's right, architectural kind of conversations and and functionality, you know, uh, conversations. And so there's a lot of power uh, to the cloud. I mean, this whole notion of being serverless uh, is something that we really embrace, which is that uh, that a developer who interacts with APIs doesn't worry about how many servers are behind the scenes. They don't worry about you know auto scaling and <laughs> up and down. They just interact with APIs, and so that is, uh, I think, the real you know essence of uh, of what's what's bringing the 
uh, the, the cloud attributes forward. But I think that the challenge, you know, as you talked about, is that the data sizes, you know, are, are really growing. There is data uh, that simply, in many cases, can't move to the cloud. And in many cases, organizations don't want it to move the cloud to the cloud. So how do you actually get the attributes to cloud, uh, mm -hmm. but be able to do that at, at land speed behind your firewall? Steve, I want to ask you a question, and I want you to take a minute to uh, explain. What yeah. is serverless mean? I mean, you've been in the industry for a long time. What is serverless? What does that mean? What's that concept mean? It's got to be server somewhere, but we hear a lot about that. What That's is, right. I mean, what behind, is serverless? behind the scenes of serverless computer, obviously, are servers. But but the concept here is that you abstract away uh, the details of the servers, you know, through APIs. One of my uh, uh, favorite examples of serverless computing is what happens in AWS Lambda as an example, uh, uh, great, great metaphor, which is that, you know, even uh, on launch day, you know, Werner Vogels actually uh, uh, went in and, and demoed uh, how uh, you could ingest, for example, images and create thumbnails on the fly. And basically what you do is I view, you know, venture event computing like modern day uh, database triggers, where there's an event that happens, you have a small piece of code uh, uh, that, that, that fires off when, uh, uh, when an event happens, like you do a put operation on an image, and all of a sudden you fire off a piece of code to generate a thumbnail. When you write that little piece of code, you don't actually worry about what server it's running on, you don't worry about load balancing, you don't worry about any of the details of, of scaling that infrastructure. You just write the little piece of code and uh, the infrastructure is transparent. So invisible servers, basically, but yeah, they're absolutely. still servers, you don't have to deal with the configurations. That's right. All right, so I know you're doing a great job, by the way, holding back all the stealth data, yeah, yeah. so you got the launch coming up. Um, um, but I want you to, to share uh, with the audience some color around what you've been hearing from customers. You've been doing the analyst tour. I know Stu Miniman from Wikibon was briefed. That's right. Um, a lot of other folks. Um, what's the feedback? What's, what's some of the, the anecdotal or specific uh, commentary coming back to you guys on you know, the, the, the reaction, the positioning? Can you share some color around? Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm I mean, trying yeah, to get the data. Yeah, no, I can share some color. I mean, you know, we're, not, we're not actually going to talk about the specific offering, but I think that what uh, what people are basically saying right now is, is that hey, there's uh, uh, what the, the problem that we're solving is a problem uh, uh, that, that that folks are really seeing that uh, that there is actually this set of data that uh, that you can't or won't move to the cloud. I mean, obviously, we we don't view ourselves competing with the cloud. The cloud plays, uh, I think, in an interesting role, even when you choose uh, to have your data on premises in a lot of different ways. For example, you might want to replicate to the cloud for uh, uh, for offsite redundancy. You might want to replicate to the cloud because you need to collaborate. You know, we're working with uh, right now uh, a lot of folks in scientific computing where the grants are funded by organizations like the N uh, uh, NSF uh, where you're obligated to go you know, to share the results of your data. So the, the public cloud is, is great for that. And then the third thing that we actually see is that the cloud is still great for uh, elastic compute. Like if you're in the media industry and you need to go do a re-rendering job or if you're in, uh, uh, you know, scientific of computing and you want to apply a new algorithm, there's a there's a, a one-time job that you may want to actually uh, 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 burst, you know, to the cloud. So we're not necessarily competitive with the cloud, but but rather uh, a really really great complementary uh, solution to the cloud, where you can utilize cloud-like uh, metaphors, cloud-like you know APIs. You can basically have the same tool chain that you're using in the public cloud, but do do so on premises. So Sounds like a lot like what Oracle's trying to do. Uh, you know, there's actually saying, a really, for Oracle, for Oracle, yeah, for Oracle, for Oracle, and I think that uh, that one of the things is is that, and this is going to sound interesting, where uh, really, really big data is uh, is not done in uh, relational databases like Oracle. Uh, you know, for example, just look at your iPhone. If you look at your iPhone, uh, you know, the, probably the number one thing is probably uh, your, your videos or your music or even your text messages, which are unstructured data, you know, because they have embedded images and embedded videos in your text messages. Uh, so it turns out that really, really big data is, is unstructured uh, data. So for example, we're working with a, uh, 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 a large manufacturer who, uh, who has sensors, uh, who has very, uh, sensors in their R&D uh, 
uh, uh, in their R&D uh, labs, basically, which generate data on the order of you know terabytes per hour. And that like, teased up the whole in, uh, Internet of Things trend as well. Absolutely, and that's 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 uh, we're seeing that. And so whether it's it's sensor data, with look even in media data, we're watching the the transition from uh, standard definition to high definition to 4K to 8K. Now you're looking at virtual reality, uh, huge, huge, huge stage volumes. Uh, in scientific computing right now, uh, I, I had the, the privilege of being able to see a lattice light sheet microscope and uh, the data that, that, that comes through that. Those things generate data at a rate of uh, 800 uh, megabytes uh, per, per second. So uh, this, these are huge, huge data volumes. And to, to do a little so bit of- So you're riding the data trend and the cloud trend for enterprises. That's right, that's right. Cloud and native meets systems management, meets systems definition. That's right, and we call, we, we actually have, have, have either coined or borrowed a term called data-centric computing. And so, you know, really, you know, the, the problems that we're trying to go solve are really around data-centric computing. And yeah. it is in this realm of data-centric computing where traditional IT infrastructure has just gotten way too complex. Like, uh, uh, you know, we, we were working with an industry analyst who cited that uh, in traditional enterprise storage, every uh, petabyte of data that you manage, uh, uh, it turns out there's always a hardware failure. You've got so many disk drives uh, in that kind of infrastructure that uh, it's been cited that you have a full-time uh, head uh, dedicated to every uh, petabyte of storage that you actually want to go manage. And so it's just, it's really gotten to the, you know, past this tipping point. Steve, thanks for swinging by our studio here, the Rosewood, for our special CUBE uh, event here with IO Data Centers um, and, and, and sharing your insight. And quickly, when's the launch date? Do you guys have a date? Do you guys know when it's going to come Absolutely. out? Absolutely. So we're going to actually uh, uh, take the covers off of what we're doing on October 11th. So right. we're definitely looking forward to uh, uh, to catching back okay. up at that point in time. Hot new startup. Obviously, they've probably got board meetings right here on Sand Hill Road in Menlo Park. We're in the heart of Silicon Valley. I'm John Furrier. You're watching the Cube. We'll be right back.